You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Bankruptcy is a very administrative process. Um, many of the litigants uh, will never appear in a bankruptcy courtroom. They'll never go before a bankruptcy judge. So uh, for many of those people, their impressions of the bankruptcy court is determined by their interaction with court personnel. We're supported by the taxpayer, and the public has every right to know what we do. And I think it's good, if for no other reason, it's good public relations. Simply go out to the community and let us know how we are serving them, and let them know what our mission is. The bankruptcy courts are starting to do a, a, a much better job in educating the public via pamphlets, via brochures, and via maybe local outreach programs. Uh, in, in Chicago, uh, we tend to speak to the local bar. We tend to speak to, the, uh, to just other agencies, schools, uh, educate schools, who, who ask us to talk about certain areas of, of bankruptcy and to educate people on that. As a second element of that is a lot of information now available either via the website or via pamphlets or brochures that explain the bankruptcy process in really layman's terms, in terms that anybody can understand. You open it up, here's the brochure, here's what a discharge is, here's how you file, here's what the petition is, here's the beginning, here's the end. And so I think we're doing a better job now about getting that information available out there. I think the real challenge now lies in how do we tell the public that stuff is available. If we did not provide this information out to the, the public about how to file, the forms necessary, the general procedures, uh, I believe we would be doing a disservice not only to the, the public, but we'd also be creating a further burdens on the clerk's office to meet its goals because those questions are still there and they would have to be answered in person by utilizing our, our manual labor. That's not very efficient. We uh, did a program with our community college here and, which was an intern program which they sent over a student from their paralegal department that or paralegal students that would work a semester for the court for a grade and I thought that was uh, that was extremely beneficial in that it opened up uh, the eyes of the students to see what it was like to work for a court, what the court environment was like. And at the same time, it kind of helped spread the word about our court and what, what it was like to work within our court. We need to provide the best service possible. I mean, a lot of these people are coming in because they've had um, bad luck. They've gotten down in their luck and, and had to resort to a bankruptcy. We're here to provide as much information as we can to make this as easy for them as possible. When they come in, they may think they're going to get average service. We want them to leave here with excellent service. The Federal Judicial Center, in cooperation with the Administrative Office of the United States Courts, presents Public Information and Outreach, the role of the bankruptcy court. And now your moderator for today's program, Bob Fagan. To what extent do your court customers really understand the bankruptcy process and your court's procedures? What are some courts doing to become more accessible to the public? Judges, clerks of court, and court staff are increasingly asked to play an important role in the court's multifaceted relationship with the media, the bar, and the community. Welcome to today's broadcast on Public Information and Outreach, the Role of the Bankruptcy Court. Today, in cooperation with the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, we're going to take a look at some key issues and challenges faced by bankruptcy court employees as they perform information and outreach activities. Through discussions with panelists both here in the studio and at our Push to Talk sites, we'll learn effective practices that individual court units develop to meet those challenges. Now, these same practices may or may not be effective for you. That's for your judges and for your court to decide. So we have quite a bit to talk about in just two hours. Our hope is that by the end of it all, you'll have a working definition of public information and community outreach as it applies to the courts, be able to identify successful techniques in working with the media in both mega cases and on a day-to-day -day basis, and finally, to become familiar with effective programs and practices that help promote better understanding among the community, the bar, and the courts. We encourage you to participate. 
Ask questions and share your thoughts with us. We've built time into our discussions for your comments. If you're not using Push to Talk today, send us a fax. Our fax number will appear on the screen throughout our discussions, and you may send us a note at any time during this broadcast. A fax form was provided with the downloadable materials on our DCN site. The materials also include many references and websites, plus a roster and program evaluation. Now on to today's agenda. To help define public information and outreach, we're going to start with my colleague Judy Roberts' interview with David Sellers, the Assistant Director of the Office of Public Affairs in the AO. This interview will be followed by a panel discussion on media relations. We'll cover not only mega cases, but also daily working relationships with the media. After that, we'll take a short break, and then our community outreach and education panel discussion. We'll focus on both national initiatives and the efforts of individual court units in reaching out to members of the bar, school, and the community. We'll then provide a short wrap-up at the end. And now, as part of a taped interview, David Sellers, the Assistant Director of the AO's Office of Public Affairs, and my colleague Judy Roberts will introduce us to the field of public affairs with the emphasis on the bankruptcy courts. They'll discuss basic definitions and concepts regarding public information, community outreach, and the courts. Hello, I'm here with David Sellers, the Assistant Director for the Office of Public Affairs at the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts. Just about a year ago, David joined us to talk about the role of the district court clerk and how it related to the world of public affairs. And he has agreed to do the same thing this time, but from a bankruptcy perspective. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Judy. Once again. Um, you receive many calls for information and assistance from all over the United States, queries about what do they do in certain situations. But your office is called public affairs. Could you give us a working definition of what that term means? Sure. Public affairs is kind of the, if you think of it as concentric circles, in the middle you would have public affairs, and then on one circle would be public information, another one would be media relations, and then the third one would be community and educational outreach. Public affairs encompasses all of that, and it's frankly another term for communications, and it's a, a term we're comfortable with in the, in the government setting as opposed to the outside world, which uses the, the term public relations, which has some kind of slicker connotations that we, we don't like in government. Could you tell us a little bit more about each of these areas separately. For example, public information, what does that encompass? Sure. Pub public information used to 10, 15, 20 years ago be as simple as a sign that says this way to the clerk's office. Uh, today it's become much more sophisticated and it could be a kiosk in a courthouse, which many have now that uh, allow the public to find their way around or even to locate information about cases. Uh, public information is basically uh, good business. It's making the public comfortable when it uses your courthouse. And we see lots of courts uh, taking directions in that step nowadays with the kiosk, as you said. And uh, we've even heard of uh, court staff being asked to follow the signs and practice what they are seeing right. in that area. Now, the media is always an ongoing issue. Um, how do you, what, what is the scope of that in your world? Uh, media relations has two, again, primary components. One would be the reactive, which frankly is what most of us do, and that is a reporter calls you or asks you a question and you respond. Uh, the other that the judiciary is uh, stepping into uh, with a greater degree of frequency is the proactive, and that is trying to get media interest or support uh, for programs uh, that are occurring either in the courts or the administrative office or the federal judicial center. Uh, so you put the two together and you have a a full-scale media relations program. And it sounds as if there's a relationship between media relations and community outreach and education because again we need the help of the media to get our message out there to the public. Tell us what you do with the public outreach. You're absolutely right. Again, these are two very closely related areas. Uh, community outreach and education outreach are opportunities for judges and court staff uh, to become more involved with their community and school groups 
to help them better understand what occurs in federal courts. That can be the judges and the court staff going out to these institutions or inviting school groups and others into the courthouse. But an important component of, of these programs is to invite uh, community leaders, school teachers, uh, and the media. Uh, because again, while you may be speaking to uh, 20 school students, uh, the media can take that same message to thousands or sometimes hundreds of thousands of people. Could you tell us why it is so important for the courts to be proactive in these three areas? Sure. I think it was Alexander Hamilton who said that the courts were the least understood branch of government and also the least powerful. So the least powerful we probably don't have any great problem with, but no one wants to be misunderstood or not understood at all. And I think there's just a general uh, understanding that you can't really trust and have confidence in something uh, that you can't comprehend or don't have knowledge of. So we have an interest in opening up the courts. I think they are fine, outstanding run institutions and there's something we should be very proud of uh, but in order to, uh, to demonstrate uh, the wonderful things that are done in courts, you have to open the doors and, and let the public in. It seems that when the courts do become uh, in the public eye, uh, it's usually a negative story. Uh, could you tell us what are the challenges in dealing with negative stories in the press? First, we need to talk about some definitions. On one side, there are negative or critical stories. On the other side, there are stories that are inaccurate. First, let's talk about the inaccurate stories. That's when you have uh, somebody's name spelled wrong. I've seen several stories where the reporter might confuse the plaintiff and the defendant. That's easy. You pick up the phone or you email the reporter and you make a correction. And I think that any reader, whether it's a judge or a court staff person, has a responsibility to make that correction. Now, the critical or negative is a lot more difficult because those are the ones we have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, this is critical. This yeah. says bad things about us or our institution but is it accurate? Um, and more times than not, it's, it's accurate. Um, and, and then you have to look inward and say, maybe there's some ways we could improve so that same story wouldn't be written a year from now. I find that judges, like other public servants, uh, develop relatively thick skins and they're used to reading some critical things about themselves in the paper. Uh, clerks of court may not be quite as accustomed to that, uh, but I think as you become a public figure, we all get, get used to it. Does that become a greater communication issue? It does, and again, it also becomes a greater part of planning so that while well, you're not going to make these critical or negative stories go away, uh, I think every one of us knows there are some areas where either us, our court, or a particular program in our court may be vulnerable for publicity, and the media nowadays is, is everywhere and is very aggressive, and you ought to assume they're going to discover that sooner or later. So you have two choices, either make that problem go away or figure out how you're going to communicate about it when the press discovers it. Just the public outreach take an enormous amount of time uh, and people, human resources. Are there ways the courts can manage their time and their planning more effectively so that it won't be such a drain on their resources? Sure. I think particularly in the areas of community outreach, they can plan, they can pick one or two programs they want to undertake a year. Because frankly, there are probably, every school in the community would be interested in learning more about the courts. You just can't, can't take yeah. that on. So you target what your interests are and pick a program or two each year. Uh, the other thing that courts are doing with a, with a m much greater degree of success is simply sharing. Uh, picking up the phone or emailing a colleague court or getting on a listserv and saying, we have this issue that's come up either in the media relations area or community outreach. Do you have any experience? And they're finding that many of them do. And again, that helps them from having to reinvent the wheel each time it comes up in their court. We just heard about um, Northern Georgia's bankruptcy court. One of their uh, strategies was to help their fellow probation and pretrial offices uh, with understanding bankruptcy terms. And so they have prepared a manual to assist the probation and pretrial officers uh, in understanding the fundamentals of bankruptcy since so many of the folks that these people deal with have also experienced bankruptcy in their lives. So that's been a wonderful sharing of information mm -hmm. within the judicial family that has been very beneficial for everybody. It's a terrific example because too often we think <laughs> in terms of judges or court clerks or probation officers <laughs> or federal public defenders, but you're right, it really is a family and like any family, it should share what it's doing and the probation and pretrial service officers more than anyone else who works in the federal court 
uh, are the face to the community. They get out into the community, they interact with the community, and there's no better issue for them to talk about than bankruptcy and fiscal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that should be a, a wonderful model for others in the country. Are there other ways that chief judges and clerks can work together to, um, to strategize for the future? Well, again, I, I hope when they get together either just as a court or when they're the annual chief judges meetings or clerks of court meeting, uh, that they put this issue on their agenda, public affairs, because I think they'll find that their colleagues are doing an awful lot and they'll learn, uh, learn ideas and about programs from others. Uh, we plan on developing a website on the JNET, on the intranet, on what Great. is occurring in, in prim primarily community outreach so that if a judge or a probation officer says, gee, I wonder if such and such a program exists, they'll just click on there and say, here it does. They can download it and uh, mm -hmm. take it from there. Uh, but I think it's, it does start with the chief judge and the, and the clerk of court uh, for others to become convinced that, that this is important, that we're busy people, we have lots of other uh, issues we need to worry about, but public affairs needs to be somewhere high on our agenda and they can kind of set the tone for the rest of the court. Now, David, about two years ago, um, you all initiated three pilots in public information, one for a district and others were involved with the circuits. How have they developed their expertise and how available is this expertise to the bankruptcy courts? Uh, it, it's available, uh, the, the pilot has gone past the pilot stage and now it's permanent, I'm pleased to say. Great. And the resources that are available through this uh, program are for uh, everyone from the chief uh, circuit judge to bankruptcy to magistrate to probation officers, they're, they're court-wide services. Uh, when the program started, as you mentioned, it was in the Northern District of Illinois, one district court and uh, two circuits. Now it's also in the First Circuit, the Second Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit. Uh, the Third Circuit has Assistant Circuit Executive, who among her duties are community outreach. And the Eastern District of Missouri has a Deputy Clerk of Court, who among her duties are community outreach. So it really has expanded, and uh, I, I hope to see more of it. And there, these are services and people that the, the court should draw on for their expertise. So they're available for a phone call? Absolutely. Phone call, email, email. Or, or call us, and we'll put you in touch in with touch them. In touch with them. That is great. A great amount of resources. Now, I'm often asked when we initially started this conversation, well, what does David Sellers do? Because he has to have all the information at his fingertips and there have to be some days where it just doesn't happen and you must feel the stress. What do you do when you feel stress and are searching for information? Well, Judy, I've been on this job about 15 years and uh, uh, I'm sorry to say it still happens with a great degree <laughs> of frequency that I'm asked about things I don't know anything about and I sure do feel the stress. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a terrific staff uh, of a lot of diverse skills. While there may be people who, who have uh, today are working on community outreach. Uh, the person who manages that program, Rebecca Fanning, mm -hmm. also had been the head of a big state court system, so she brings a large uh, body of knowledge beyond community outreach. Our video manager, Carrie Casola, works exclusively on video, but he likewise has uh, years of background in other areas, so I can walk down the hall and, and get terrific counsel and advice. Plus, as you mentioned, these people working out in the courts as public affairs professionals, mm -hmm. uh, they're an email away or a phone call away, and I'm not hesitant to tap into them. Also, we find that our colleagues in the state courts in many of these areas are way ahead of us, uh, largely because state and local judges have to run for re-election. Uh, they get more out into the community, uh, so we contact our colleagues in the states. There's a listserv of state court public information officers that I participate in, and uh, I put questions on the listserv, and in a matter of minutes can get 10 responses back to here's how we handle this in the states. So uh, there's an awful lot I don't know, an awful lot I'll never know, and that's what keeps the job challenging. And interesting. But there's yeah. a tremendous uh, network of public affairs people uh, who understand courts who weren't available 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. ago. David, how do you deal with the immediate issues while you're looking for the appropriate resources? That's a good question, Judy, because in the news media, so often the responses they want are five minutes ago or yesterday. They want quick responses. So the first question we ask when a reporter calls and asks us something is, what is your deadline? Is your deadline tomorrow? Is your deadline an hour from now? And if they say uh, our deadline is right now, we try to tell them, well, realistically, we're going to have to call three people to get the answer. And they need to understand that sometimes it'll take some time. So you don't want to be forced into responding mm -hmm. uh, and saying something that is inaccurate or something you wish you didn't say. You want to take your time and respond carefully. 
And the media realizes that, and often it's in their interest to sometimes extend that deadline uh, if it's worth waiting for you. So you look for ways to buy some time. Uh, you tell them, I'm do everything I can to get back to you, even if that means to call the reporter in an hour and say, I don't have a response yet, but I've made contact with the appropriate person. We'll have something for you in 15 minutes. If you keep the communication going, the reporter will wait for your answer. It's been often said that in the absence of information, we create our own information. So by doing this, you're giving them something to, to build their patience. Absolutely. Just be careful not to create your own problems by responding immediately. I can tell you that people in our office, who, some of whom do media relations for 20 or 30 years, uh, most frequently listen, hang up the phone, even if they call back in three minutes, you want an opportunity to process what you've been asked, mm -hmm. unless it's something that's, mm -hmm. that's very routine. So it's, it's, it's worthwhile uh, taking your time and thinking so what comes out of your mouth makes sense. And you'll, you'll know about it when you pick up the paper the next, next morning. Day. <laughs> and I hear that um, in the coming months for next year, you'll be working on some bankruptcy initiatives in your public information office, public affairs office. And I think there's going to be a financial project That's for correct. high schoolers right. trying to help them develop their skills early on. Right. Uh, you're, you're right, Judy, that a lot of our outreach work with schools to start with has been targeting high school students, mm -hmm. uh, in part because they're going to be voting soon, they're going to be jurors soon. But the part that you mentioned is, is also true. They have to become a little more financially responsible. Mm -hmm. They can't always depend on mom and dad to, to, to solve their, uh, their money problems. And... Uh, Credit cards are awfully easy to get nowadays, right. and I, I should point out I have a five-year-old son who got a uh, uh, an ad for a credit card in his name. So it doesn't you don't have to wait till <laughs> high school. Now I can practice uh, fiscal responsibility at home and just rip that ad up. But with the high school age uh, students, you really need to teach them how to be a little more responsible in terms of their finances, and and we plan on to trying to do that in the next year or so uh, with outreach events. We also want to develop. Uh, curriculum material that we will put on the JNET and the mm -hmm. internet. So if a judge or a school teacher or a community leader wants to uh, talk to students or other groups about bankruptcy, they'll have that material readily available uh, electronically. David, it sounds like you've got some great plans for the coming years to help these bankruptcy courts and the clerks deal with areas of public affairs. Is there any final advice you'd like to give the clerks and their staffs out there watching this program today? If there are uh, topics that bankruptcy judges and clerks think that we should be uh, touching on in any of these areas, media relations, public information, or community outreach, uh, I hope they'll call, email me, get in touch with me however they'd mm -hmm. like because we want to produce programs that are useful to the courts and reflect what the courts need. Uh, s the second issue is something we touched on uh, earlier, but we can't overemphasize the need to plan. And this is probably more true in the bankruptcy courts than any other part of the court system just because of the sheer volume of work. So that's a good angle to start with their strategic plan, is to pick a small area for success and build on that to increase the information and communication with the public, the bar, other courts. Right, and once you've identified that area, when you start communicating, it'll get only easier because you'll find that there are other courts, there are bars that'll help you out. We'd be happy to help. And we encountered this when we started community outreach in our office because it uh, started from scratch about three years ago and we found there was so little being done and there so, was so much interest that we really had to quickly narrow the focus and we continue to do that. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of schools that would be interested in getting information about the federal courts, whether it's bankruptcy or probation or pretrial services or virtually anything that occurs in the federal courts. We simply can't handle that workload mm -hmm. so we, we focus and uh, uh, the internet and the JNet have been wonderful to, to, uh, tools in helping uh, helping the focus, but still you really need to limit what you want to take on. In order to be successful. Absolutely. And then build on that. Yep. Well, David, thank you for sharing your ideas and your advice today. I think you've given the bankruptcy court some good I suggestions on how to begin to be more active in public affairs and to continue the good work they're already doing. Well, thank you, Judy. Thank you. Okay. Now, armed with that background in public affairs, we'll head into our first panel discussion on media relations. Joining me in the studio is the Honorable J. Vincent Ogg, Jr., U.S. Bankruptcy Court Judge for the Southern District of Ohio, Kathleen Farrell, Clerk of Court for the Southern District of New York, David Oliveira, Clerk of Court for the Middle District of Florida, 
and also Richard Corelli, Senior Public Affairs Specialist at the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts. Welcome, everyone. Let's go around the table. Uh, judge Ogg, let me turn to you first. You've had experience uh, with the media both as a federal judge and also as uh, a member of the press, member of the media. Uh, what do you find to be the most challenging uh, aspect of, of dealing with the media, and why do you think it's so important to uh, develop a good relationship with that press? Well, Bob, uh, as uh, Judy and David uh, made reference to, uh, the stakes are very high these days in our contacts with the media. Uh, we're making the news like we've never made it before in terms of uh, intense scrutiny of the bankruptcy system. Uh, the press is looking into our caseloads and they're uh, taking apart the, uh, and debating the issues in the reform law, such as who, who should be eligible to file bankruptcy and which debts should be discharged and uh, the great diversity of exemption uh, laws. So there's, there's really uh, uh, no part of our system that isn't uh, under the microscope right now. Um, this <laughs> The stakes are high, and as you know, the, uh, the scope of coverage uh, has been, it's just run the gamut from uh, absolutely deserved and constructive criticism all the way to the worst kind of stereotyping and, and negative image uh, building you could possibly imagine. So um, when you get right down to it, though, when, when we have contact with the media, the challenge, I think, the biggest challenge is to get a read on two factors. Uh, the first one would be to try to figure out the angle or the, the perspective that the press is, is, uh, is really trying to achieve. And the second one is some sort of assessment of the skill involved uh, in the, the reporter or reporters who are covering the story. Um, with respect to the angle, it, it's awfully easy to, to miss what the reporter's after. Uh, sometimes they'd prefer you to miss it, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> But indeed, uh, you may have a story to tell about uh, your caseload and how, efficient, uh, how efficiently the system is working. And uh, the reporter might be much more interested in getting some sort of an economic forecast or, or kind of a comment on the deep uh, policy issues underneath the code. And, and if, if the trick here, I think, or the goal is to really develop as best you can a rapport with the media and with individual reporters, especially the ones who are working hard to get it right. Uh, to, to minimize the chance that you'll just miss that altogether and uh, really come out making some terrible mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the skill level uh, of the reporters, uh, some are better than others and some have more time than others. And uh, it's very important to develop a technique for, uh, as we used to say in the press, for, for developing a good lead and, and having your major theme stated up, up front and to try to control as best you can the flow of information, either by setting up events uh, before you're asked to, uh, when, you, when you know that there's something that the press is going to be interested in. Um, all of this is, uh, is really, um, it's, it, it sort of lends itself to developing a protocol, if you can, which will give you confidence in a situation to uh, sort of to approach a situation, but, but always with the knowledge that things are going to go a little differently and you, you have to stay loose. Uh, I think another thing that increases the anxiety level is, is that there is this delicate uh, dance of negotiation between the courts and, and the media. They, they need us for stories. We need them to get our message out. And, uh, and we're, we're using each other to a certain degree. So you've got to quickly figure out uh, where you stand with the media. And also, there's always the, uh, the knowledge that mistakes, when they do happen, are very hard to fix. And uh, I think that presents a challenge all by itself. We might talk later about how do you fix mistakes. Yeah, but, that's, uh, uh, that's a really important. But that's, that's a, uh, my quick read on what, what makes this a challenge. Well, you've given away all the secrets of the, uh, oh, of the media. Oh, I, I wish I had more. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Uh, Dick, you've also had uh, media experience, having covered the Supreme Court for the Associated Press for uh, 20 years, and now you're working with uh, the Office of Public Affairs. So what would you add in terms of challenges, and, and what do you feel are the media's uh, expectations? The media's expectations and desire is, is access, and that is access to information that they, that they know the court has, information about particular cases, or they may be seeking information about uh, uh, in a story that might focus on the court itself, although most often I think they're looking for specific information um, that is contained in a case that is before the court. Uh, 
otherwise, the, the media expects to be treated um, on a level playing field. Um, a reporter for a newspaper and a reporter for a TV station or radio station expect that they will have the same access to the same public uh, uh, documents um, and don't want to feel that, uh, that they have some, some kind of uh, uh, handicap in, in covering the court. The, um, the access they seek could be access to the courtroom itself if there's a proceeding uh, and what's going on there. Uh, it could be to the papers involved in the case or uh, nowadays to electronic uh, files and electronic orders from the court. The, the challenge, I guess, for the courts um, is to provide the media with, with a feeling that the court is responding to their need for access. Uh, probably the most important thing for the court to do is to provide the media with a go-to person. Uh, who do I talk to, most often in the clerk's office, who do I talk to who can tell me where I can find this information or can tell me that this information isn't available? Um, there's also uh, the challenge um, for judges and, and those who work with judges of trying to build a rapport that, that Judge Ogg talked about when the cast is constantly changing on the news media side. It's, it's somewhat ironic. In a, in a day when, when there's more and more news coming out of the bankruptcy court, the news media's commitment to legal f affairs in covering bankruptcies and, and other legal matters is really waning. And so what that means is that you have a constant turnover of reporters and often very inexperienced reporters showing up at your door. It's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a real challenge. Kathleen, uh, as clerk for the uh, Southern District of New York, what's been your experience in, in terms of working with the media? Do you do that yourself? Do you have your judges uh, go directly with the media? How does that work? Uh, well, the judges don't go directly to the media. Um, they do obviously have contact with the media in the courtroom. There's always press in the courtroom, especially we've got Enron. So especially in the Enron case, there's, there's judges at the door. Um, for more formal communications with the, uh, with the media, there is an assistant circuit executive in charge of media relations, and formal communications will be made through him. Um, I have done interviews with the press for uh, for for more uh, for programs that we're involved in, like electronic case filing or something like that, or statistics. I, I will give that information out. Um, we do want to uh, make sure that uh, the information that we give out to the press is correct. So, um, and when we get a large case like Enron and we get a, a phone call that there's a large case coming, de coming into the court, I, one of the first questions I ask is, uh, will this attract a lot of media attention? If so, I need a PR person and a phone number to uh, defray phone calls that are going to start coming into the court. Yeah, and you have an assistant circuit executive. You have a access yes. to his, uh, for public affairs, do you yes. not? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah. And he would be making any formal uh, presentations and communications with the press. Yeah, yeah. We're going to be talking a little bit about something that uh, that's been that was put right. together by that right. assistant. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. Executives. Yeah. Um, you also use the web a lot uh, to we, convey we use, information. We use the, the web a lot to convey information. Um, after 9-11 we used the web. We used um, from home. I did a, a new home page from our web explaining what happened and explained to people how they could still get access to the court. Uh, we still had two divisions open. We had a judge sitting in White Plains. So we used that as a mechanism to get the, the message out to everyone. Um, we also, I was in, con in contact with the district court executive and the circuit executive. So we did uh, have uh, uh, messages out on the news, radio stations, and television giving, telling people the status of the courts in Lower Manhattan that were, of course, closed for a few days. But uh, by the next week, we were all open and we were able to get that message out through through the media. Right. But folks were able to file, in fact, uh, Absolutely. during people, that period of people time. People were able to file during that time, and yeah. we did get that message out, and yeah. we did have filings during that period of time, and we got the message out that people could go and access the information at the two divisional offices and where they were and how to get there and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, David, Middle District of Florida is actually the <laughs> third largest in the country in terms of filing, and that, that must create a lot of interest in terms of the media. Give us an example of the kinds of information that uh, they might be interested in and and how you handle it. Sure. Um, unlike Kathleen, we don't have Enron. Uh, most of our press interest is drawn by our statistics. We were up 22 percent last year and this year we're up about 5 percent. Mm -hmm. So most of the questions we get, press inquiries we get, are focused on those statistics and what they mean. And the biggest pitfall is they're trying to get you to write their story. 
you're up 22 percent. What's causing that? Isn't it teenagers with credit cards? Isn't it old people with medical bills? Um, and you just really have to stay away from that. Give them the statistics. Make sure everybody has the right statistics. They're, the, they're available to everybody at the same time. But stay away from writing the story for them. Make them write the story. That's what their job is. Stick to your yeah, job, which is just collecting the statistics for them. That's really a key, a, a key uh, bit of advice here because uh, I'm sure we'd all agree that, um, that um, trying to interpret too much and trying to write their story has the potential of causing some tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous so one problems. One misplaced yes could turn out to be a long <laughs> misquote. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's shift from the, the, the challenges and what the media really wants to both um, some methodologies for providing the information and also uh, we'll uh, provide some suggested uh, do's and don'ts. What can clerks or court staff do to, to help reporters uh, uh, understand court limits perhaps? So, uh, so Judge Og, let me turn, turn to you again. Well, it, uh, a subject at the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judge was uh, handling the press in mega cases uh, about a year and a half ago. And um, the, the, the audience was mostly attorneys, but the, uh, the work that went into that really provided a number of pointers, uh, which we dubbed the Ten Commandments of Dealing with the Press. And, uh, and they would stand anyone in good stead uh, who, who has an encounter, especially one that's sort of a high pressure uh, on the spur of the moment type of encounter. But the idea of controlling the flow that I spoke about earlier, creating media events that you can prepare for, uh, writing a good lead and sticking with your theme are, uh, are central to uh, how you approach the, the, the uh, subject. Uh, a few other ones, I'll just name a couple because there were a number, but uh, one of them was uh, never lie to the press, never ever lie. But at the same time, it's a little counterintuitive. You can expect them to lie. And David gave a perfect example of how, how a reporter will load up a question with, with a theme, not a fact, but a theme and an assumption. And you have to be very careful uh, not to respond inappropriately or you'll be quoted as having exactly that opinion. So I mean, talking about, uh, uh, about uh, leading questions, the press are, are masterful at it. Um, but uh, another one is uh, regards stonewalling, and, and there's this concept that uh, the comment, no comment, is just always a negative, uh, unfortunate way to respond to any inquiry. If you can't answer the question, explain why you can't, what, rule, what the rules are, and uh, <laughs> the press will appreciate it, actually, mm -hmm. and you won't look like you've got something to hide. Um, Telling bad news first is always a good idea if you're able to, just to steal the thunder from someone who may be out to uh, make it worse than it really is. And uh, finally, th there's that concept of off the record that's, uh, that a lot of people feel they know how it works, but it's very important to get a reporter to say out of the reporter's mouth that something is off the record. If you preface a remark by saying, and this is off the record, and then say it, it's not off the record. So you've got to get that commitment. Uh, witnesses are not a bad idea either. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> occasionally you're left with uh, no option but to write a sorrowful letter to the, uh, the editor-in-chief of the paper telling how you've been abused. And usually, <laughs> usually if you're doing that, it's a little late yeah. and uh, the mistakes are hard to fix. Um, I must say, though, that uh, that the website that's been developed for our court uh, is, is now of interest as a possible tool for fixing those mistakes. And um, I haven't used it that way yet, but uh, I think it may happen. Yeah. Um, you were kind enough to forward to us those Ten Commandments, and uh, for viewers to know, we're going to be adding that to our court operations exchange, so you will all have access, uh, access to it. Uh, Dick, would you add anything to add to the judge's comments? No, I, I think uh, I think he's on target with all of them. Um, they're well thought out. Uh, I would I would add that the um, that often a, a reporter who gets it wrong is not acting out of malice, but is just clueless. And um, and introductory materials, any materials that will help in orientation to a reporter who isn't that familiar with bankruptcy law or the ways of the court, uh, could be very valuable. A question for both uh, both uh, Kathleen and, and David. Uh, again, relating to who in your court actually meets uh, w with the media. We know it can be different from uh, from court to court. Some courts, in fact, have local rules on the subject. Can the judges? Can the clerk do it? Um, talk a little bit about Kathleen about your um, the use of your uh, assistant circuit executive. 
Well, um, I found out that our assistant circuit executive uh, put together a, a meeting with about 55 journalists, editors, um, news media people, uh, together with the, the New York uh, State Court. And they had a, a symposium, and they put basic information in here for uh, about the state court and about the uh, federal courts. And bankruptcy court in particular, what they've got in here is basically the, the basic bankruptcy book so that people, uh, media covering the, bank the bankruptcy court will have some basic knowledge that they can refer to. And it's also got uh, something that we call the survival guide to the records room, <laughs> which is basically just how to simply find information in our court. It can be a little uh, overwhelming to people who are not familiar with the court. So we give them this little guide, and it, it sort of explains to them how to get our electronic information or how to get information that is still on paper or conventionally, and, uh, and even how to access records from the archives. Important so for the media, important for your own employees, a survival guide to the records. Uh, abso absolutely. <laughs> we use it a lot. It's a, pop they get stuck there. It's a popular <laughs> little document. Right. <laughs> right. David, let me turn to you in terms of what's done. If, uh, on the rare occasions where we have to put out a press release, it would be either drafted by myself or a member of the clerk staff, and then the chief judge would approve it and release it after he talked to the presiding judge for whatever division is. We have three divisions. Um, but most of the time, we just get routine inquiries about our statistics. And those are handled by the deputy in charge, by myself, my chief deputy. Uh, so the, it's very inf a good deal more informal, it appears, than what Kathleen does. We're going to turn to a few push-to-talk courts, I understand, uh, or I hope are on the line. We have Mark Hatcher, clerk of court from the Western District of Washington on, uh, Washington on Push to Talk. Mark, you have a person designated to deal with the media. How does that work, and what do you think are the, uh, the greatest challenges in that area? Well, hello, Bob. Um, uh, Western Washington, we're a medium to large size court, but we don't have a lot of high profile or mega cases. Uh, the inquiries that we get from the media most often concern bankruptcy trends and statistics, and we've designated uh, the court's administrative analyst to handle these questions, which come to us uh, pretty routinely on a monthly basis. Uh, for continuity's sake, we found that it's good to have just one focal contact person dealing with uh, these kinds of questions. And I think, too, that the media appreciates that and the relationship that they've established with this person. and frankly, just knowing who specifically to contact for information. Uh, occasionally, we do get calls from reporters wanting information for a story. Um, oftentimes, it's a reporter writing a general interest story on bankruptcy. And uh, like some of the other panelists have said, often it's somebody who is new to the subject of bankruptcy. And they just want somebody to educate them, give them some sort of an overview of the process. Uh, other times it's a reporter writing a story about increased filings and they want our interpretation or perspective. And um, uh, I'll usually handle those uh, as clerk or my chief deputy will. Um, and we try to stick with the facts. Um, uh, like some of the panelists have said, it's, I think, important to be careful about interpretation and so forth. So we aren't academics, uh, we aren't in the business of studying trends, so we try to be careful imparting uh, information in that regard. Uh, we also sometimes may be asked to refer reporters to attorneys or trustees who might shed light on particular aspects of the bankruptcy process or even on a particular case. And in those uh, circumstances, we're happy to make those kinds of referrals. Um, what we found, I think, in terms of working with reporters uh, is that it's important to recognize that their lives really revolve around deadlines, and it's helpful to them that we return their calls promptly, even if it's just to say, I don't know, or I'm looking into it for you, or whatever. And, uh, of course, uh, just being forthright and straightforward on the issues, you know, is important. Um, we found that also that it's been good to cultivate our relationships with the press and establish a rapport. Uh, we seldom seek the press out for publicity, but it's good to know that a rapport has been established uh, and that uh, we can cash in on it if necessary. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I guess the last thing I'd Sorry. say is that um, one of the other things that we do routinely is issue press releases. Uh, on our bankruptcy trends, and that kind of keeps us in the view of the press. 
Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. I, we have Jerry Crockett, the clerk from North Carolina Western, I, uh, on the line. Jerry, how is it handled there? Hi, Bob. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Bob. In uh, North Carolina Western. Uh, if you'll please turn have, down your um, sound so uh, there won't much be any feedback. What Mark was saying, in, in actually a lot less uh, of a major area, we really don't have anyone in particular other than myself and my uh, what I call the statistical anal analyst person. And it's probably primarily just statistical information that uh, various various people want. And um, they seem to be very happy about it. We put the information on our website, the, the filings, the yearly filings, annual filings, and the chapter filings, and the divisional filings. And that seems to keep uh, most of the people informed of what's happening in our district. Thanks so much, Jerry. Let me ask members of the panel, are there any surprises in dealing with the media? Perhaps. Uh, uh, misquotes or a failure to understand what might be involved in a chapter uh, 11, some misrepresentation. How do you go about correcting it? David. Well, reporters have a job to do just like you do, and they want the story, and so they expect you to be responsive, and we should be responsive, clearly. Um, they want to get it right because their credibility is at stake, their career is at stake, so they, they have a sincere interest in making sure they get it right. And occasionally they don't, and when that happens, Usually a, a call or what, an email, however you're communicating with a particular reporter, will, will solve that issue. You've got it wrong because, and that'll be the end of it. And if that doesn't work, uh, of course, you can always go higher to their director or their editor or whatever, thing like that. But you also have to be careful when something's put out there that's not right, and it's clearly not right, and on its, on its own merits, it does not stand well. You perhaps should not waste your time get, trying to lend any credibility to it by responding to it. Let it consider it water under the bridge, and as the judge mentioned, maybe use your website to put out the right information or something. But to respond directly to the reporter or, or his publication or whatever it is uh, may not be the best thing to do. Judge, your reaction? Well, you know, on the positive side, every now and then I'll get a call from a reporter who wants to wade through the complex uh, drafting of the code, especially where it's, things are really not very well drafted. And I am just thrilled when that happens. And I, I am thrilled to work with reporters when they call up and want to get a story right and, and give them information without any advice and if, as long as it's not case related. But on the negative side, when, when there's really a, a massive screw up, uh, as, as we saw in the first 10 days of the Federated case, uh, I, I was on the record. I, I was not writing letters to the editor. I, I told the reporters that made the mistake that this was really unacceptable. Uh, uh, an unacceptable level of work and it scolded a lot of people and, and the next hearing there were only two reporters there instead of 20 so uh, apparently and they were very good reporters and you found but, a secret but I, I, I really uh, you know that case caused me I mentioned before you you have to develop techniques but then stay loose in that case I changed everything I had been doing for 15 years uh, of working with people and absolutely clammed up privately and made all my contacts with the press on the record uh, in in court on the record and and uh, we even had some interchanges back and forth about what they expected of us and what we expected of them so uh, it was um, you know that that mistake actually <laughs> was fortunate in the long run because it was the last one uh, mm -hmm. nothing anything like that happened but you know right off the bat we had 120,000 employees who thought they were going to be fired the next mm -hmm. day for no reason at all it was it was uh, it was a wake-up call for all of us, I think. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Judge. Um, increasingly so, technology, especially the use of the web, has had a big uh, impact on distributing case-related information, be it a mega case or, or just any case uh, in general, and not just to the, the media but to the public at large. And Kathleen, as mentioned before, uh, your court has the Enron case. And uh, if you'll explain a little bit about how you use the web to get uh, the information out and uh, what you see are the advantages of that. And Enron certainly has put us in a focal point. I, we're wow. under the microscope. Yeah. Everybody's looking to see what we're doing. Um, and one of the things you don't want to get out there is incorrect information. So you want to make sure that what you're getting out there is consistent and correct. So um, for Enron and other mega cases, we have used utilized the website. Um, and when a mega case files that is going to attract a lot of media attention, oftentimes we'll just get the basic information out there quick on the website so that the press can get access to it. 
for Enron, we have uh, a hyperlink to the Enron website, which in turn hyperlinks to another website, which provides for free the, a copy of the court's documents. It's got a big disclaimer on it that it is not the court's documents. And we didn't set the pace on that one. I understand San Francisco did it with the uh, Pacific Gas and Electric case. So we sort of followed their lead in it. So well, the courts are learning from one another on what works. Because when uh, Enron first filed, uh, it really did drag our system down. Um, for people who don't know, our court is totally electronic, and all of our cases are available electronically. So everybody trying to get access to that case really did slow us down a bit. So major, major advantages to, to us is keeping, it, it kept the phone lines down. There wasn't the flurry of activity coming into the courthouse to get information. The press was getting it immediately over the internet when the uh, judge issued a, uh, an, uh, an opinion on the um, venue motion. Um, 20 minutes after it was issued and docketed, I saw CNN broadcasting about it out in front of our building. So it does work. It gets the information out there quickly. What a change in how information absolutely, is communicated, absolutely. Uh, case They're related. Not clamoring at our door anymore. Yeah. That's right. But you also make a, uh, another excellent point that um, with, with technology, you have the abilities to link to other, to other mm -hmm. sites, in this yes. case the Enron site, yeah. but you have to be very careful to let them know that you are the source of, the true source of right. the case-related right. information. That, that, that's that information is secondhand, that ours is yeah. The, yeah. the official file and record, yeah. yeah. Uh, we also have in our Push to Talk line John Soretto, Clerk of Court for the Central District of California which I believe is the largest bankruptcy court in terms of filings. Uh, John, you have the Orange County Chapter 9 case. How do you use the web to get uh, information out to the media, and what do you see are the advantages? Well, Bob, uh, first I'd like to uh, commend you and the FJC and your panel participants on uh, their fine topic and presentation. I happen to believe that uh, public outreach and understanding the media is a very important part of the judiciary mission in this program will go a long way to that understanding. Uh, with regards to our Orange County case, I'll, I'll give you a little story that when the uh, case first filed, I had a reporter which obtained a uh, directory of the court and called every uh, clerk's office staff member and every member of chambers in order to try to get a story and to get some background information. And the bottom line is when they want to uh, get a quote from somebody in the court, they will find a way of doing that. <laughs> so I think it's very important that you, uh, you think about in advance how you want to present the court, anticipate what the news media wants, and, and what the court is capable of uh, communicating. And in that light, uh, what I learned from that is that you really don't instruct your staff to not talk with the media. Rather, it's more important to give them a response that if they get that phone call, such as uh, please contact the clerk of court at this phone number, or please contact uh, this liaison person who has been designated for the case, or give them the website address and say information is available here. People feel more comfortable if they can say something other than uh, no comment and such. And like other courts, when we have a high-profile case, and uh, in also in the Orange County case, for example, we automatically just put the initial case filings and important orders uh, of the case onto the website under a section that we call high-profile cases. Even though we, of course, uh, have PACER, as with everyone else, the media doesn't necessarily have access to PACER and those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things. I think it's also very important that you provide uh, educate that the court provides educational and background materials to the media, which is suitable for your typical newspaper or television soundbite. And I'm talking about fairly basic items like the difference between a liquidation and a reorganization. Uh, even though I know many courts have very lengthy descriptions of these areas, you know they're looking for something that fits within one or two sentences, and it's very important to get that out. Also, if the, your, your particular judge is okay with this, the, the case uh, presiding judge, and it's appropriate, you may want to provide an official photo and bio of the judge to the media. They're, they're going to usually, in a very high-profile case, they're going to want something on the judge. And if you have an official bio, at least you may get it right. Uh, I know it was amusing here on how many different schools uh, the particular judge had attended, and none of them which were accurate because they were trying to get information from unofficial sources. And also I think it's appropriate 
that there are many things that the court should not comment on a high-profile case. So you may want to work out something with the president of your local bar, and if your bar is large enough, if you have a commercial law and bankruptcy section like we have here in Southern California, where they will designate experts who are not associated with the case who could provide information to the media which are opinion related which are things the court of course should stay out of uh, one thing which is not directly web related that we learned early on is when you have a very large case typically you're going to have more media wanting to go to the case than you have spots in your courtroom in the hearing so it's very important to create a media pool early on in the case have them elect a uh, liaison, and then you work directly with that liaison in terms of uh, uh, handling uh, how the media will go into the courtroom. Uh, they will uh, select members that will rotate in and out of the courtroom. Uh, if necessary, work with your local marshals. You can issue tickets to the courtroom so that uh, you, you have an appropriate representation of both the public, the, uh, the media, and others associated uh, with the case so you don't have on a first come first serve where they can overwhelm your courtroom and uh, finally i would suggest if you're going to talk with the media uh, do it from written notes and uh, if necessary even have a written statement that you could hand to them or even put out on the website in the form of a uh, press release that's great information thank you thank you so much john uh, um, from California, this time the Northern District, we have Gloria Franklin, the Clerk of Court. Uh, Gloria, um, we know you have the Pittsburgh, uh, the Pittsburgh, the <laughs> Pacific Gas and Electric mega case. Uh, uh, what are the advantages in terms of, uh, of dealing with the web, uh, with the press, uh, if you can? Hi, Bob. This is Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Bob. This is Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Laura, if you could please turn down your um, sound. Just as Kathleen described for the Enron case, um, uh, PG&E is one of the largest bankruptcy cases ever filed in history, in our history, and it has generated tremendous amount of interest um, from the general public, uh, special interest groups, the bar, and the media. And we've had uh, press coverage at almost every hearing and have had to deal with more than 30 press organizations um, in our court. And as, as a result of this interest, we have made it possible for the public to really, to readily access case information uh, through our website. Uh, however, our first con the first contact point is our website, and we have a link to the pg and &E website, which, is, which provides um, case docket and information and links to the, uh, all the documents filed in the case. But most importantly um, for us, the web has also been useful in providing special instructions to the bar, the media, and the myriad of special interest groups that we've had to, um, to deal with and who are interested in attending the court hearings. Uh, we've had to provide special instruction uh, to the, the media and uh, these special interest groups on courtroom decorum. Uh, seating assignments as well. As you might imagine, we've uh, had a tremendous crowds, and the courtroom, of course, um, capacity cannot handle such crowds, and we've had to uh, uh, request that people register over the, um, the website and um, pay special attention to all of our requirements and expect expectations. This has cut down tremendously. Just having all of the information on the website has cut down tremendously on all the telephone calls and inquiries for information on most of the common uh, documents that are filed, like the voluntary petition, list of 20 largest unsecured creditors, any special notice list, disclosure statements, and the reorganization plan. Uh, we also have a feedback button that provides an opportunity for the public to comment on um, any information, the way we display the information on the website, um, and of course any comments or complaints they may have about um, information that is not there. So it's proved pretty useful um, in, in handling and controlling a lot of the um, information that uh, comes our way and what people want to know. 
uh, about uh, this court and uh, any of any of our uh, uh, mega cases in general. Thanks so much, Gloria. I'm going to go around the table here just for some one-liners, if you will, from our because uh, we're just about at the end of this session from our panel. Just some final advice, Judge. Well, Bob, I used to think I knew a lot about dealing with the press, but the truth is, over the years, uh, most of the lessons I've learned have, have been associated with a certain amount of pain. Uh, I think it's important to know that there, these are skills you can learn, and, uh, and with all the media consultants uh, today in the world and with technology changing fast, uh, it's important for all of us to pick up these skills. And, and to remember, you have to stay a little bit loose uh, and uh, recognize each case is different, each situation is different. David. I think, again, I would emphasize that don't be responsive, but don't fall into the trap of trying to write their story for them. Um, remember that when you talk to a reporter, you're, of course, representing yourself. Your name may or may not appear in the print. You're representing your court, and you're representing the ju judiciary. So what you say may have big implications. What I say in Tampa doesn't seem like it'd be nas of national interest, but it may be if a reporter spins it just right. So you have to be real careful and mark your trail as you go along. Dick. <laughs> mark your trail. Dick. I'd say uh, be prepared, yeah. be patient, and don't lose your sense of humor. There you go, there you go. Kathleen, final uh, One of the things that I would say is uh, it, it is a, the 500-pound elephant is sitting there, and the media, contact with the media has changed over the years. So have a policy in place. Set up some protocols how you're going to deal with the media when it does start pounding on your door. Um, have the spokesperson designated in advance. Uh, make sure you know the parameters that, that are to be followed, and make sure that everybody in the court knows what they are yeah. so they know where to direct the courts as someone, uh, the calls as they start coming in. That's great. Uh, it's time for us to take a five-minute break now, and when we return, we'll focus on community outreach and uh, education efforts. Before we go, I'd like to thank the members of our panel, Judge Ogg, Kathleen Farrell, David Oliveira, and Dick Corelli, as well as our Push to Talk and phone-in participants. During the break, we'll be showing some summary points and additional thoughts on dealing with the media. See you in five minutes.
we need to demystify the experience of coming to a federal court. And I think the means to, to achieve that is to provide as much information about the court experience as we can prior to the individuals coming into the courthouse itself. And that can be describing what the general procedure is within a court, within a hearing, particular hearing, uh, providing information as to how to get to the courthouse, local parking facilities, even areas where uh, an individual could even get lunch during the breaks in the courthouse so that the anxiety is, is lessened by this experience of coming to a federal courthouse. Our court is very active in reaching out to the community and the, and the judges take, I think, great pride in being able to go out there and talk to different, uh, whether it's law schools or whether it's grade schools or high schools or just other constituencies in the community that wish to have that invite someone to talk to. They are constantly out there talking with the general public and with the people involved in the, in the judiciary about about really about about issues that are affecting the judiciary and about where we're going. We also have to be considerate of the needs of our pro se debtors. And what I mean by that specifically is that we have to uh, be aware that they may be less informed and work towards providing the information that they need to understand our system of justice. Part of that um, responsibility is also to ensure that they take advantage of the protection that the bankruptcy law offers. And in order to do that, they have to be familiar with the system that provides that protection. The Northern District of Illinois has developed a joint program with the bar and with the judges and with the clerk's office to help pro se litigants get some information that they normally wouldn't get for free. It's basically a pro bono program that, that they allow for the pro se's. And what it entails is three hours a week, there is an attorney that's sent from the bar to answer basically questions from pro se litigants about pending bankruptcy matters. We got terrific training from the court. The on the ground training in the law firm is probably the most important because it gets the attorneys comfortable uh, with the system. Younger attorneys are automatically comfortable with the system because they grow up utilizing computers. We do also solicit uh, feedback from our users of our services in terms of a, a survey that they can fill out either online or, or hard copy. We've utilized the results of that survey to improve a, a number of our services, particularly at our intake counter where most of our walk-in traffic comes in, but also the services that we provide over the internet as well. In the second part of this broadcast, we're going to focus our attention on community outreach and education. Let me welcome back Kathleen Farrell and David Oliveira. Joining us now are the Honorable Carol J. Kenner, U.S. Bankruptcy Court Judge from the District of Massachusetts, and Rebecca Fanning, the National Community and Educational Outreach Manager for the AO's Office of Public Affairs. Let me welcome everybody again. Rebecca, let me start uh, with you. Uh, you're responsible for the national initiatives dealing with community outreach. And we heard a little bit about community outreach uh, from the interview with David Sellers. But would you provide us with a working definition for community outreach and education? Yes, well, community outreach, when it's effective, are all the very practical ways that courts connect with their communities. And our emphasis really is to bring communities into the courthouses because we have so many limitations on judges' time and also because we want to break down some of those fears and stereotypes and some of the alienation that's out there and misunderstanding. So that can be done in a number of ways. Uh, at the national level, what we do is we put together a, a, an annual initiative for every one of the courthouses that chooses to participate and then we make it a turnkey operation so that someone who's never put together an event before knows exactly what goes into making an event and we have an umbrella uh, title for that and it's called Open Doors to Federal Courts. And participation of judges is, is absolutely critical. Isn't, wasn't there a study done relating to that in fact? Yes, that's right. The Hearst Corporation uh, did a survey and they said that 75% of the respondents said their number one choice, their favorite way, the most effective way to get information about the courts is through judges. So we find that the judges really 
are a central part of the success of the program and in observing programs around the country they make all the difference. You've also established um, four criteria for uh, developing these programs as well as determining success. If you could just comment on, on those four. That's right. We uh, look at our programs and we're shaping them. First, they're driven by judges and teachers and our key audiences, and those are our two key audiences. Uh, but beyond that, we use a framework of looking at the program from the standpoint of knowledge. What kind of information are we giving in terms of the core uh, function of the courts? Uh, the structure and the role of the courts. Understanding, we try to create experiences where we see the human face of the judiciary, the judges, the court staff. Then investment, we want all law-abiding citizens, and I think this applies especially to bankruptcy court, to feel that they have a stake in a well-run bankruptcy court or federal court system and involvement. We want people who come into the courts to feel that yes, they can have an impact, yes, they are involved. One way to do that is to feel comfortable when you're going to bankruptcy court or to serve as, as a juror. Take, a, take just one minute and, and describe some of those programs that are part of that Open Doors to the Federal Courts. Okay, I'll just quickly tick them off. I think it's important to note that uh, our direction uh, for these outreach items started in the bankruptcy area with the Bankruptcy Advisory Group. And we were asked to put together some lesson plans that could be used both in the classroom and the courtroom by teachers and judges. So that gave us some excellent guidance. And we also have bankruptcy judges who serve in an advisory capacity and in, in an informal way so that we know that we're staying on track. So right now what we're working on is uh, a series of three lesson plans that judges and uh, teachers can use and the timing is excellent because as you may know there's a big financial literacy trend sweeping the schools across the nation and so we're linked with that and we want to make sure that our materials are compatible with those materials because we know that that will be the most effective way to distribute the information. So then we have our Open Doors to Federal Courts program and that's a variety of programs that can be generated locally or nationally. And I think I mentioned something about the national program. Uh, this year our focus is on jury service and we have found that bankruptcy courts really lead the way in participation in these uh, initiatives even though they tend to focus on criminal cases because teachers have told us what we need help with is teaching about the Bill of Rights. But we, what we find is that bankruptcy courts partner with district courts so that the district court will handle that part of the program, the criminal trial, and then the bankruptcy court has time to develop its program. And so that way the students see that it's a unified court system and yet bankruptcy court and its special needs are also highlighted. We have a teacher's website with uh, lesson plans that support the booklet Understanding the Federal Courts and Bankruptcy is definitely mentioned in that booklet and has several chapters. And then we have an exhibit that we take to social studies conferences throughout the country and we uh, expose those materials, our educational materials, to more than 6,000 teachers and that's where I do a lot of listening. Thank you, Rebecca. Just a reminder that we've included in your reference materials uh, a link to that, uh, the AO's Outreach uh, uh, website. Um, now that we've heard a bit about the, the, uh, the national definition of community outreach and something about the programs, uh, Judge Kenner, I want to turn it over to you. As a bankruptcy judge, why do you think it's uh, so important uh, for the court to reach out to the public and why is the public so interested now? I think it's because we affect such a broad spectrum of people. Um, unlike some other trial courts where there's just a plaintiff and a defendant involved, uh, a typical Chapter 11 case will affect debtor, the debtor, sometimes hundreds or thousands of creditors, uh, suppliers, vendors, landlords, employees, retirees, a huge uh, uh, group of people. Even in a fairly straightforward consumer debtor case, uh, there will be 30 to 40 creditors who are affected. So we, we affect a lot of people and it's important for them to understand the process. So there's also an, uh, an open question, if you will, relating to, the, to what is the role of the court, and, uh, and that's fairly controversial. It is controversial. I think some, and, and I think there's a, there's a number of certainly valid but differing opinions on that. Some uh, courts feel that debtor education is inappropriate, that it's not an appropriate role for the courts. Uh, certainly proselytizing uh, is not uh, appropriate. Um, so I think we, I disagree though that uh, with respect to some of my colleagues position, I, I think judges are uniquely situated 
uh, we have a special expertise that's something that we can provide to the public. Kathleen, let me turn it to you. What does community outreach and education uh, mean in the uh, Southern District of New York, and well, what do you think are its benefits? We've, we've actually done a lot of uh, community outreach and, and getting word out there in, for various things. We've done a lot of it specifically uh, for electronic case filing. Um, although we were involved in it before that, uh, we were in contact with the uh, Managing Clerks Attorneys Associations and the various bar associations in the city. Um, but we have uh, our, our staff has turned into uh, spokespersons, trainers. They go out to law firms uh, to assist them with electronic case filing. We've uh, done some uh, uh, education of our own staff, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, we've, we've done some things. We've put in a court services coordinator to assist uh, pro se de debtors when they, when they come in. We've done uh, classes with, uh, I have a relationship with some high school teachers and some college professors that routinely bring their classes through. Some law firms have uh, intern programs that they bring their uh, interns through in the summer. And I do a basic civics lesson and just sort of outline the federal judiciary and how the bankruptcy court fits into it because they probably have not heard of the bankruptcy court. They ask some really good questions. We have a judge who is very generous with his time and uh, will oftentimes set up a lunch meeting with them, which makes them more at ease with him. And a lot of these uh, students come from the inner city, and it's sort of after they've come through the court, it's like, you know, I could, I could do this. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of opens up a, a new uh, avenue to them that they hadn't thought about before. It really helps them identify with the bankruptcy court yeah. as an institution. Absolutely, and, and sort of gives them a different light on a judge when they right. get to sit down and have lunch with him. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a nice experience. Mm -hmm. David, let me turn it over to you. Well, we have uh, our, our, one of our judges has a mentoring program for the young lawyers, and we are in constant contact with the bar associations. We publish in their newsletter. We work with the, their officers and coordinate our activities through that. But we, geographically, we're a pretty pretty big district, so mm -hmm. to, to reach out requires some pretty big arms and hands. And I'm sure that comment just drew a little round of applause from my <laughs> staff down in Tampa who are commenting about my, the height I live at. But um, <laughs> Our fo focus is more on uh, people when they reach in. Uh, what, what kind of information can we make available to them when they come looking? Uh, on the website, our general information about bankruptcy. We have a handout that we have at the uh, intake window for people. Just some basics, how much it costs, what, fi what forms you have to file, what's the difference between Chapter 7 and Chapter 11, so they know that. Um, the local rules information, the judges' procedures are on our website so that the lawyers can get access to that. So we re focus more on people that are reaching in than us reaching out. Right, but that's a really important uh, a point. Just as important as reaching out with these ki the kinds of programs that have been mentioned is you have to stay on top of the kinds of information that your customers will need when they reach in for information when they uh, come to court, either through the web or actually come to the court. So you have to take advantage of, uh, of any instrument that you can to get at that, that kind of instru uh, information. Be ready to provide it for sure. them. So. Um, these are all great ideas and um, certainly reasons for these kinds of programs. And one of the things we're focusing on is um, are, are programs that can be implemented with limited resources. That seems to always be a question. What can I uh, uh, implement on a shoestring budget? And I know Rebecca talked uh, a bit before about the Open Doors to the Federal Courts program. Uh, we have in our studio today Regina Bivens, deputy in charge, and Sandy Poindexter, Strategic Planning coordinator, coordinator and Supervisor of Case Administration, both from the Western District of Tennessee, who have implemented this program for the Bankruptcy Court and with the co uh, community. I know, Rebecca, that you work very, very closely with both uh, uh, Sandy and Regina. Yes, I do have the privilege of working with both, and they are two of 74 courthouse coordinators that have been cultivated over the past three years. We started with zero, and then the chief judges uh, asked different people in their courthouse to take the lead on this program. And it really does require leadership, a lot of professional skill and personal skill. And as so, what is so true in life is ask a busy person, and that person will really achieve the results you want, that's the case with uh, these courthouse coordinators. And uh, so I would like to first start with you, Regina, and uh, this year we've developed a resource pool and both Regina and Sandy have offered to be part of that so that as veterans they can talk to newcomers to organizing the program. And Regina, perhaps you could tell us what you did to make the program work in your court. 
Rebecca, one of the keys to success in our court was to have the support of the judges and the clerk. By having their support, we were able to get the resources needed and also they were able to provide contacts that may be able to assist us with the program. Another resource is to have the Bar Association involved. By having their support, you're able to get the additional information needed to provide a legal resource in preparing for the program. Another resource is the Board of Education. By having their support, you're also able to have an additional contact to make the additional contact needed with the principals and the teachers. Of course, another resource always is clerk's office staff as needed. They provide you the finishing touches that's needed to make the program come together. These resources, along with the flexibility provided by the AO Public Affairs Office, has enabled us to be able to put on a successful program each year. Thank you, Regina. Sandy, could you add to that? Yes, Rebecca, I have some pointers. First of all, look within your court for resources. Make it simple, keep it simple for yourself and everyone else. It really helps make everything relaxed and enjoyable. And have fun. Uh, people remember a good program. Contact Rebecca Fanning. She's a great resource at the AO. She's very helpful. And remember that the title of this outreach program is Open Doors to Federal Courts. The federal courts are reaching out to initiate ongoing relationships and interactions with the public. Well, thank you very much. And I, I think the audience can understand why this is really the favorite part of my job is because the court coordinators add so much to the program. And every single program and every courthouse, even though we have a national framework for it, is very different and really suits the needs of the particular bench and the community involved. Thanks uh, uh, again to both Sandy and Regina for joining us. Um, I want to remind listeners that are pushed to talk to let us know if you have any questions or you'd like to highlight an effort in your court. And uh, we're going to try to have a few minutes to open up the lines for that purpose later in the broadcast. Or if you want to fax in a question, please do so. We have received a few faxes that relate to the first part of the broadcast. And we're going to try and get to them. But if not, for sure, we're going to make sure that uh, uh, that the individuals that can answer those questions, uh, it'll, they'll be referred to them. Uh, Kathleen, your court actually puts uh, its entire strategic plan on the Internet, so everybody, the public, can uh, readily see what the court's uh, high priorities might be. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, we, we do put it out there. We've done this. This is our seventh uh, strategic plan. We'll be out there very shortly. Um, we feel that we want the public to know what the mission of the court is, what the court's uh, direction is. Um, it keeps everyone um, focused and involved with the strategic plan. Certainly the staff certainly all knows what it is and before we make any major decisions we look to the strategic plan. We put other things out there on the on the website um, to make it easy for people to give us, f to see things to where we're soliciting from feedback such as the, the more recently we put out proposed guidelines for requests for debtor in possession financing and some procedural guidelines for uh, filing pre-PAC Chapter 11 cases. And we put them out there for comment from whoever wanted to comment to them, and we gave them an email address to send it back. So we use the website a lot, and we'll, we'll highlight things that are new and, and put it out there. That's great. So. Uh, David. You know, I like to focus on those that reach in um, and how you can handle that. We, we have customer service reps at each at uh, each division to help someone that comes to the counter and maybe not be familiar with the procedures. We also have a clerk suggestion box which allows people to mm -hmm. provide an input when they have uh, a question procedure we're using or, or have a question about why the court is operating a certain way. Though there are, uh, and you need to look at each one of those as you receive them seriously, though we've had some interesting ones. Uh, the one that recommending that we establish a drive up filing uh, <laughs> didn't go over real well, though it was a good source of humor on a tough day. So. <laughs> Uh, on the Push to Talk line, we have Mark Hatcher again, Clerk of Court uh, for Washington Western. Uh, Mark, to continue the theme of customers reaching in, I know you've been very active in promoting improved customer service at the counter. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and also um, uh, some of your efforts to educate the bar on using CMECF? Just take a minute or so. Uh, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I think like most courts, we, we do place heavy emphasis on providing good customer service both at the front counter and over the phone. 
we know that many of our customers will never enter a bankruptcy courtroom or, or appear in front of a bankruptcy judge and that their views or perceptions about bankruptcy court uh, will largely be determined by their interactions with court staff. So we try to stress to the staff that we have an obligation really to the institution to appear professional and to provide helpful, courteous service. Um, in our district, we have a very large clientele of pro se filers, and a lot of them are confused and they don't understand the bankruptcy process. So we try to convey to the staff that it's okay to be helpful, and we try to give them the tools to be helpful. Um, I think it can be too easy to fall into the trap of not being helpful for fear of crossing over the line of providing legal advice. Uh, so we talk about legal advice, and we talk about the difference between that and procedural advice, and we try to make the distinction as clear as possible so the staff can feel empowered to be helpful. Uh, we also rely on some of the FJC videos on that same topic. Um, we've also found that it helps in terms of staffing at the front counter to have a complement of both new and experienced people working together uh, so there's always a resource for help, uh, particularly on those borderline questions. And lastly, we encourage staff that it's no negative reflection on them if they want to call for a supervisor or manager to come out and clarify a point with the customer if they feel it's necessary. Uh, I, Bob, you also uh, uh, mentioned with respect to reaching out to our customers on CMECF, uh, one of the things we've been doing as a supplement to our on-site training classes is making house calls to the law offices. Uh, in our district, electronic filing, it's voluntary. Uh, and we found that it helps to be as accommodating as possible in order to encourage the attorneys onto the system and also to keep them using it. So we'll actually send a group uh, comprised of automation staff and ECF trainers to individual law offices to either help the attorneys get started or even to troubleshoot problems they might be having. Uh, you know, we'll do this on request. Um, oftentimes we'll do it. Um, uh, at our own volition, we'll just volunteer ourselves uh, to some of our largest filers. Um, on these visits, we tend not to get too involved in hardware issues and installing equipment, uh, but we do look at the attorney's computer settings and configurations, uh, particularly if they're having connections or performance problems. And Now, this is a new and growing customer service we're providing. Uh, and I must say it's been very well received by the bar. Uh, in fact, uh, it's helped catapult our participation rate to, to well over 50% of the practicing bankruptcy bar in the area here. Well, that's, that's tremendous, Mark. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, I, we have Gary Drake on the line now, and I'd like to, um, I know, Gary, that the Northern District of, of Georgia is very, very active in, in CMECF, um, one of those courts that jumped on the bandwagon so early in the, in the game. Um, but I would like you to focus on something else because I know that you've developed a bankruptcy-related program for probation and pretrial services officers. Explain a little bit about why you did that. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, we did create a PowerPoint presentation that we have presented to probation pretrial services in the Northern District of Georgia, and it is based directly on the Bankruptcy Basics Public Information Series published by the Administrative Office. Uh, I was approached by one of the Deputy Chief Probation Officers about making this presentation because they were seeing in their work a growing number of defendants with a bankruptcy history. And they were uncertain of the bankruptcy process or even what the different chapters represented. Uh, the presentation was very well received by the probation pretrial officers there, and I suspect we'll be making this in the future as they bring additional officers on board. Uh, this is a presentation.